So I want to start by talking to you about a friend of mine called Aviva. A few years ago, following the birth of her second child, her husband had a stroke. As a result of this, he struggled to use language. So Aviva decided to develop an app displaying a remarkable practical streak for someone with a background in philosophy. This app was designed to help her husband speak again and to help anyone with issues with speaking to learn how to speak or to relearn how to speak. So she recorded her own voice. The app encourages the user using audio and visual cues to repeat words. So she was able to use her own voice and put this app on an iPad that allowed him to use this every day. Recently, he's been learning one new word a week and has been able to use the app to say his daughter's name for the first time in years. His youngest daughter hadn't heard her father say her name since she was 10 months old. And his eldest daughter hadn't heard him say her name since she was five. That was over eight years ago. This app is an example of an assistive technology, which the World Health Organization defines as technologies whose primary goal is to maintain or improve an individual's functioning and independence to facilitate participation and enhance overall well-being. Assistive technologies hold immense power for people who have had strokes or who suffer from dementia or who have intellectual disabilities. As the global population is aging and increasing, we're going to have more people with dementia, we're going to have more people with intellectual disabilities. So assistive technologies are going to be a hugely important technology. They're going to help many vulnerable people live with greater independence. My work, though, is as a philosopher. I focus on the ethics of technologies, and specifically at the moment of assistive technologies. I'm not able to do anything practical, such as design these new technologies. But I want to use assistive technologies as a starting point for a discussion about the ethics of technology in general. I think that with ethics, we can make the best of new technologies. If we think about how we develop new technologies, we can ensure that we avoid the worst pitfalls that sometimes come with these technologies. We can maximize the benefits of these technologies. This is all the more important because at the moment, we're in the midst of a world suffused by tech, a fourth industrial revolution, some people say. Technology is being introduced into our societies at an incredible pace, sometimes for altruistic reasons, uh, such as Aviva's Talk Around It app, but sometimes propelled by a relatively unchallenged corporate momentum. So if you think about it, we all have smartphones now. Most people in the audience will have smartphones. More and more people are using wearable technologies that can measure our heart rate, work out how much exercise we've had, we're developing automated cars that might have to decide whether to kill its driver or occupant in order to save more people. We're developing the Internet of Things in which inanimate objects all around us, buildings and utensils in our homes will be able to communicate via sensors with each other and able to be able to monitor us. Everywhere we'll go, we'll be surveyed, but we'll also be able to communicate with these things. So all of this suggests the need for ethics. We need to think about what these technologies are for, what sort of challenges we want to avoid, and how to maximize the benefits. So I suppose I should talk to you about ethics. Ethics is about right and wrong. It's about what is obligated for us. It's about what is prohibited. It's about what duties we have. Do we, for instance, have a duty to protect the most vulnerable in our society, or do we just do what we want with our property? These are the big ethical questions. What's ironic now is that many of our new technologies are beginning to undermine the ethical values that we uphold in our society. So what are the values of modern society? We're very concerned with issues of liberty. We want to be free from government interference. We want to be free from people telling us what to do. We want to be able to go where we want, walk around where we want. We want to be autonomous. We want to be able to think for ourselves. 
We don't want to be brainwashed. We don't want to be subject to propaganda. These are incredibly important modern values. We also want to have technology. We're a technophilic society, so we think of technology as representing progress, and sometimes associate that with moral progress. This can be questioned, and this is what we do in ethics. We also want to talk more about what sort of society we're going to develop. And this is the most important question. So let me talk about the way technologies, ironically, can undermine some of our ethical values. The most common one is privacy. If we think about privacy, it's being undermined all the time. Our smartphones know where we are. Big companies such as Facebook are able to tell a huge amount about us. They're able to tell our sexual preferences, how we're likely to vote, what we want to buy, and so on. This data that we're voluntarily giving away is hugely problematic. So you mightn't care whether these companies or anyone else knows much about you, but you mightn't care if people see intimate photos of you. But in terms of our autonomy, in terms of our ability to think for ourselves, we need to protect our data. Autonomy, in the philosophical sense, concerns our ability to think for ourselves, to govern ourselves, to give ourselves a moral law. This moral law requires certain conditions, being able to have space to decide for ourselves. If we give away a lot of our data, if we begin to tell companies we want this, we like this, we respond to that, these companies are able to influence us more easily. They're able to know what I'm likely to respond to. They know that I've traveled to Vilnius, that I study philosophy, that I'm interested in movies or whatever it is I'm interested in. Hence, they're able to target ads or messages specifically for me. So this becomes a big threat to our autonomy. And if we threaten autonomy, we undermine the premises of liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is founded on the idea that we're able to choose for ourselves rationally. So giving away our data undermines the conditions of autonomy. Let me narrow it down even more. One of the conditions for autonomy is being able to pay attention to certain things. I should be able to attend to what I want. I need to be able to send my attention where I want it to go. But as people find out more and more, as companies or new tech is able to find out more and more about what I think, how I'm likely to respond, what's going to work for me, they're able to grab my attention. They're able to send bespoke messages designed purely for me in order to get my attention. This limits my ability to think for myself. So you might ask how we've allowed this to happen. What is the sort of ethical reasons we've allowed this to happen? And to me, this goes back to the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment came up with a number of ethical theories, and it placed human autonomy at the center of what society should be about. Society was decided, it was decided that society would be about individuals choosing for themselves, making autonomous choices, being rational. This very much suits the marketplace, and it suits a certain type of individualistic society. In this society, as long as we're autonomous, everything is meant to be for the best. So then we can rationally choose to give away our data and undermine certain things, undermine autonomy, undermine privacy. The problem here with, enlightenment's, with enlightenment ethics is that it doesn't allow certain questions to arise. Certain questions such as questions of flourishing, questions of the common good, questions such as what is best for society. So I want, in this way, to go back to the future. I would advocate technology being developed according to an older ethical tradition, the ethical tradition of the early Confucians of the Buddhists, of Aristotle. These were virtue ethicists, 
And they believed that we should think about what is a person's character, what's a good character, what's a good way of life, what is human flourishing, what is the common good. Rather than allowing everyone to decide individually for themselves what would be the best, they asked questions that don't arise in Enlightenment philosophies, questions of the common good. These questions will benefit our thinking about new technologies. We might be able to come up with prize systems so that we get more technologies that will benefit people who are vulnerable, benefit people with intellectual disabilities, benefit people who have had strokes, benefit people with dementia. We might be able to avoid the market failures that come about when we get a very sort of individualistic, rationalistic system. For example, big pharmaceuticals, their system develops drugs for first world people. There's no money to be made in developing drugs to help diseases of the third world. So you have a, the global health burden is overly represented in the third world. We don't address their diseases because the companies are under no obligation to think about that. Their only obligation is to shareholders and stakeholders in their own area, which allows them to develop stuff that will get them a profit, not what's good overall for the common good, for the planet. With virtue ethics, we might begin to think about these common goods. We might begin to think about prize systems that would design or incentivize assistive technologies for the people that need them while reducing the impetus to grab patents so that money can be made back. We might begin to think about technologies that will nudge people not towards consuming more and more, not towards purchasing more and more, but towards consuming less, consuming more ethically, towards reducing their carbon footprint. If it is the case that these technologies can influence our autonomy, why not it influence people's autonomy, influence their actions for the good, for environmental reasons, make people more charitable, make people more concerned with the environment, more concerned with future generations. I think with virtue ethics, this will solve some of the problems that our market-based and atomistic enlightenment philosophies have resulted in, in our current technologically suffused world. Virtue ethics can help us ensure that more technology is going to be like Aviva's talk around it app, designed to promote a common good and a flourishing society, rather than just producing profit. And this, I think, is why we need to look to virtue ethics in order to develop our technologies. Thank you very much.